our goal for clients, right? The goal that we've kind of pushed in the, in the, I pushed in the book and have written articles about is trying to get a 10% raise per year, right? Using that whole mindset to invest in yourself, figure out ways in which you can improve yourself, your ability to produce, your ability to create value for others and increase that by 10% per year. That's a start. That's the starting point. And if you can do that, right, that's going to give you way more wealth than any investment can give you. Are you a solopreneur looking to two times your revenue to fund your lifestyle and give back? Well, this podcast is for you. We bring you inspirational guests sharing actionable tips to solve many of the struggles you face each and every day. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Hello to the Build, Live, Give podcast. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a regular, thanks for your support. Love to get your feedback at paul at buildlivegive.com. Com. Our guest today is someone who worked in finance, in the financial services industry, and was hit by the perfect storm, in particular, the massive financial crisis in 2008. And through sheer tenacity, he has now built a 60-strong team helping people to find freedom, not retirement. So why listen? First is the importance of having coaches both in business and in personal life. The second is the hierarchy of wealth, the 60-40 split. You'll learn a lot about that. And the third thing is how to use top grading to pick the right people in life. And this also includes the people that manage your money. He has a great book called Heads I Win, Tails You Lose. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Patrick Donahue from Paradigm Life. Welcome, Patrick Donahue from Paradigm Life to the Build, Live, Give podcast. Great to have you here, Patrick. Uh, thanks for having me on, Paul. I'm uh, excited to talk to you. Yeah, well, look, we haven't had too many people from Salt Lake City, so uh, we'll have to ask you about that. I know pre-interview, we've been talking a little bit about my upcoming trip to Utah as well, so thanks for that great advice. But no speaking problem. of you, why don't you tell me something your friends or family would know about you that we may not? Well. Obviously, as an you know, as an entrepreneur, I own a, a business. I'm involved with a ton of people. I have a podcast. I wrote a book. Uh, but I was actually painfully shy growing growing up, and I I never had a serious girlfriend or relationship uh, before my wife. So my my wife is uh, my first, and I think my last love. <laughs> That's probably something that most people don't know. <laughs> Isn't it? Excellent. And, yeah, we, and, and and we got married. Like we got our, our engagement process was like. We knew each other for about nine months and it, we got married within six months of uh, being engaged and I uh, saw her, we saw each other about four times between the time we got engaged and the time we got married. So crazy wow. story. We married 16 years. So. 16 years. Excellent. got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's brilliant. You got three beautiful children as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got a five, five-year-old, 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. Excellent. Well, uh. My 15-year-old, as I said before, is a, a mad surfer. And um, yes, he's. Uh, we've just got to try to get him focused on school first, surf second, but really struggling with that one. It is, but that's the thing is like sometimes you don't want to peel your kids back from what they're passionate <laughs> about, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. It's, uh, you know, it's the, um, yeah, o often you reflect on the conversations your parents have with you and it's like, mm, here I go. I'm saying the exact same things they said to me. So, uh, look, I, I know you run a hugely successful uh, finance business now. We're going to dive into that more in a moment. But why don't we just start off with, you know, how you, you know, worked for a, a big company and then ended up going out and running your own show. Yeah, I mean, I, st I started uh, the business, well, I started in the business that, you know, I essentially broke away from in 2004 and it was in financial services. They did uh, some investment. They had a, uh, like a debt consolidation and credit repair arm. Uh, they also had a, a mortgage and lending division. And I essentially learned about uh, what I do, the type of financial advising, financial strategy that we specialize in from, uh, from a, a woman who had been doing it for uh, about 15 years to that point. And that was in 2006. And in 2007, I decided to uh, essentially create a business underneath this, uh, under this, this, this kind of corporate uh, umbrella. And, and it went awesome. You know, but obviously, 2007 was you know, the last year before the crazy yeah. financial crisis. And so during that uh, couple of years, 
uh, I essentially broke away and bought myself out of uh, that that umbrella company and then have been on my own since, since about 2009. But officially, the business started in 2007. Great. And, you know, how... Um, everyone's got their tale or story from 2008, but what, what was yours? What did you see, especially being in financial services? Um, yeah, how, how tricky did it get for some of your clients? Well, it was, yeah, it was crazy. It was, you know, basically a perfect storm. And I would say the convergence of multiple storms for me, you know, I, I had two little kids uh, I also had never run a business by myself, and I also did not understand the legal framework in which I created the business with this umbrella. And I, you know, essentially agreed to things that knowing I would have not knowingly done it if mm. I had had it run by an attorney. <laughs> but this, you know, that that was a lesson in and of itself. And then, obviously, with the uh, financial crisis, people didn't have uh, money. They were liquidating investments, liquidating savings uh, to survive off of because they weren't employed. Uh, and then obviously getting people to do more and to save was a challenge uh, as well. So it was one of those kind of perfect storms with uh, a business failure as well as the economic environment not being uh, fertile enough to to really get a business to get off the ground. But I, you know, it was there where I learned a lot of valuable lessons. And I think my tenacity to uh, not give up definitely played a role in surviving, right? And I'm super glad I did. I mean, I was at a point where my wife was like, you need to knock this off and go get a, go get a job, go work for somebody else. And, you know, and I almost did, but I'm very thankful I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, so what advice, because I've, I've had that uh, question from my wife several times, and uh, I batted it off and it was my tenacity as well. But, you know, just for people listening now, just give a bit more insight into, you know, what, what really helped you decide that, no, I am going to stick this out. Well, that's a good, it's a good question. You know, I'm not sure if there's anything that was, was singular. It may be just, I would say this could be just as much as a weakness as it can be a strength. But I, I, I don't give up. If, if I, if something, if I don't, if something doesn't work, I was talking to you before, like, you know, I grew up playing sports and in the business world, you know, golf is a sport that everybody, you know, is, is, is accustomed to. And I, I worked on a golf course when I was in high school and then, you know, I played every once in a while, but I never took lessons. So obviously with, you know, a hockey, I played hockey growing up. So I had that type of, you know, hand eye coordination. I worked on a golf course and I played, but I never got lessons. And, and I, you know, would just go to, I'll play with friends or play in business. And, you know, it was one of those just, you know, a couple good shots, a couple bad shots, a couple good shots, a couple bad shots. And it was just really frustrating. So, you know, I, I went and got like a simulator for my office. I took lessons just so I can get to the point where, you know, I, I was good. So I've always had that, you know, whenever I'm passionate about something or will do something, I won't, I won't quit. And I look at, you know, entrepreneurs, especially in this day and age, people have a, a tremendous fear associated with failure. And I believe that fear is one of the greatest uh, signals of breakthrough. It's a signal that is, you know, essentially, the, you know, life is telling you, this is something that you need to address and not circumvent and not uh, shy away from. It's something that you need to uh, push through. And I've used that in so many different circumstances. I teach it to my, to my kids because, you know, you're, there's always going to be something you're afraid of. There's always going to be a challenge. That's just the, the nature of, uh, of humanity. And it's the ability to connect challenge, fear, difficulty, tension, anxiety with, with powerful lessons of growth. You know, just for a perfect example is, you know, weightlifting or getting stronger. Getting stronger, you actually have to rip and break your muscles down. Uh, in order for them to build even stronger. So that, that analogy really resonates with me because it's kind of a, a philosophy that I have about not just my, my personal or my uh, professional life, but my personal life too. Yeah, look, uh, that, that's a great insight into who you are and how it's really helped you. And you know, who else has helped you get that business up and going? Like, you know, now you can reflect back, I think, what, you're 13 years in? Is that right? Yeah. Yep, yeah, in, yeah. The four, in the 14th year. <laughs> yeah, so. 14th year. So, you know, I now... I know now that you run a really big business, but who helped and supported you at those, you know, in 2009, 10, 11, those really tough years? 
Well, the, the mentor that taught me uh, really the, the financial strategies, she was, uh, you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki. She was the, yeah. uh, his first financial uh, planner, financial advisor. And so she was definitely a sounding board for that, uh, for that period of time. But you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I look at all the different challenges that I've had when I've made the decision to push through that, to face it, to tackle it, to overcome it. It's weird how just people show up in your in your life. And so that 2009, 2010, it was just me having the philosophy of not burning bridges, of maintaining relationships, of having integrity, uh, of committing to what I had committed to, which is difficult, especially as a business is burning down around you. Mm -hmm. uh, through just a relationship, I formed uh, a, a, a nine month joint venture with a, uh, like a financial education group. Uh, and that is one of the things that saved me. And I have a, a relationship with this guy to this day. Um, and in fact, I was with him last week in, in Hawaii at a, at a conference. Uh, but you know, it, relationships I consider as, as our most valuable asset, uh, the relationships we have professionally, our reputation, uh, what we do, our integrity. There's a saying that I love, which is, you know, how you do everything is how, or how you do anything is how you do everything which is you know, having that integrity, having principles, recognizing that your reputation and then your relationships with others, especially as you put others before yourself and look for their needs and try to fill those needs, whether it's connecting them with another relationship or uh, you know, helping them with a problem or a challenge that they have, that's re always reciprocated. And I've always had that, that philosophy. Uh, but you know, I've, had business, I've always had a business coach. Right now I have two business coaches uh, and uh, I changed it up this, this year. Uh, so I have two female business coaches. I've, all, I've always had male coaches in the past. And I don't know why. It was just kind of you know, serendipitous where these two women uh, were referred to me. But it, it's been incredible. It's allowed me to understand myself better, my business better, uh, the relationship I have with my family, with my business, with other people in the business, especially those that don't necessarily have you know, the same upbringing, background, you know, uh, you know, social structure. And, uh, and it's been powerful. It's been, you know, and I always do that. I've had, you know, incredible business coaches along the way that have, you know, really allowed uh, another perspective that, uh, that I didn't have. We only have, you know, we have blinders. We have, we have a certain way in which we view the world. And, but there's a million other ways in which it, it's viewed our circumstances, mm -hmm. our decisions, uh, you know, our opportunities and having, you know, someone that is not associated or affiliated or tied to the, the success or failure of that decision is powerful. So I think, you know, having a coach, having a mentor is, uh, is always going to serve you. Yeah, look, I, I completely concur with that. And you now you talked about that partnership that really changes the trajectory of your business and relationships being so important, which I agree with. But, you know, tips for people listening now on how do you know, how do you know other than instinct that that is the right partnership to get into? Yeah. Well, you, I would say it's the reciprocation. So at first I go into all relationships finding out how I can serve and I don't have anything to, you know, I, I go in and really you have to believe this internally. You can't just, for me, I can't fake it. Because people can can read others very well these days, and if there's an ulterior motive, people can sniff that out. And so I go into all relationships with figuring out a way in which I can serve, how I can help, uh, and I go into it not expecting anything. When someone reciprocates and they feel compelled to reciprocate and they follow through with that reciprocation, uh, that's I would say the first sign of. Uh, first sign of a partnership or some sort of re relationship. Excellent. Obviously, there's way more to it. <laughs> I mean, you, know, yeah, you, yeah, just, no, but you don't just go off of that, you know. But I would say that that's one of the first one of the first things. It's like, um, you know, there there's a gosh, what's the name of the movie? A a, a Bronx Tale, uh, which is like a you know American movie mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, I think Robert De Niro is in it, and you know he tells the story of when when a you know girl if you uh, you know, she goes, if you open the door for her, right. And then she goes and unlocks the door for you. It's a sign that that's a keeper, right? So I think that's one of those signs. It's not the only thing that you're going to use, right. To determine whether there's a, a healthy future, but it's a sign. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, didn't Robert get in a little bit of strife lately with the way that he talked to one of his team members? Was that Robert? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> yeah, like, but, yeah, but but that well, advice that, from him. Everybody has a story, right? Everybody has an interpretation <laughs> and a meaning about what's said. I mean, it's it's always been it's always been that way. 
Uh, and you can spin things in a million different ways, take things out of context, context and so forth. That's, it, it's making it harder. It's making it harder to determine a person's integrity, uh, their values, uh, how they do business. Um, but like I said before, you know, that saying of how you do uh, any, how you do everything is how you do anything. You know, you, you, there's signals in the past, right? There's, you know, what, there's a, an interview structure that we use called top grading and there's a whole book on it. And top grading has been fascinating because I've connected the dots of, you know, really finding the right person for the right position and, and finding the top 10%, the top 10 percentile uh, of qualified people. And so top grading helps you do that. And this, and the uh, question structure of top grading is, is all about learning from their past and asking questions that are not the, you know, rhetorical boilerplate off the shelf questions that people have canned answers for, right? These are questions that people really have to think about and it opens up their world as to how they've handled situations in the past. Because, you know, like I said, there's breadcrumbs, there's, there's breadcrumbs that have been left. You just have to look for it and ask the right questions. Great. Well, what we'll do now is move into the build section where we talk more about your business today. So when someone comes up and asks you, hey, Patrick, what do you do? How do you best describe that? Uh, I basically say, you know, you know how people are uh, not getting ahead with their finances? Well, my company walks alongside you and we use uh, proven strategies that uh, allow you to live a more fulfilling life and actually achieve financial freedom, not just retirement. So it's, it's, I know it's kind of a buzz line type of thing, but you know, it's, it's important because you know, I think there's a, a narrative associated with what people should do with their money. And it involves uh, you know, mutual funds, ETFs, the stock market, as well as banks. But there's other ways to save, other ways to invest. And that's why we focus a lot on small business owners and entrepreneurs self-employed people because they've taken that first step because the best investment you can ever make is in, uh, is in yourself and building your business. And this notion of retirement, um, I believe is a very flawed idea and more flawed now than ever before because of longevity, right? Retirement was a very short term solution to getting old people out of the marketplace. So you can make way for younger people. It was originated in, in, uh, in Germany and Prussia, uh, brought to the United States and other other countries have adopted a very similar mindset, uh, but I think it's I, I think it is one of the most anti uh, life anti human uh, ob objectives that uh, that people have, uh, because we're not meant to stop. We're we're mm -hmm. meant to continue to thrive. It's what gives us gives us meaning is when we are able to make a difference in somebody else's life. And most people don't look at their job as that. They don't look at I'm going to show up at nine to five and I'm going to create value for people. No, they show up and they're like, I need a paycheck, I need benefits, and then I'm gonna go home to my family and you know, have fun there. It's like people don't look at their profession uh, as, their, as their life, right? It's kind of a means to an end. But I believe if you reframed it and looked at you know, the world we live in and all the opportunities that exist, you can align your profession and your work with who you are, what your strengths are, what you're passionate about, uh, what your gifts are, and, and be rewarded greatly for that. Plus, you love doing it. And I think if you get onto that trajectory, that is what's going to create a financial, financial freedom because it's more of a mindset than a circumstance. And, and that's where, I, you know, where we set ourselves apart uh, is we, are, we call ourselves prosperity economics advisors, right? Where the objective is not retirement, the objective is, is freedom. And there's different strategies and techniques and, and ways in which you can structure investments uh, so that that's the outcome, not, you know, this retirement at uh, a certain age in the future. Yeah, look, uh, and I suppose we're singing from the same hymn book because, you know, Build, Live, Give is all about, you know, what's the lifestyle that you want to achieve, to your point, then how do you build a business to achieve that? So not the other way around, cart before the horse. And then, you know, how are you going to give back? So very much aligned. And that's why a lot of people listening would be really interested on how. So I get the philosophy, Patrick, I'm all on board. But what do you know about achieving that, that freedom that others don't? Yep. Well, I'll, I'll take a step back and just make one comment on what you said. So there's, there's a, a local uh, billionaire family. He, the, the actual like patriarch of the family uh, died a couple of years ago. 
but he wrote, he, he's written a couple of books and, and I've seen this theme with everybody else. I mean, Bill Gates and his newest documentary is a perfect example. Uh, but in this book, uh, the guy's name is John Huntsman and he had a uh, kind of a manufacturing uh, company, a chemical company and anyway, just an incredible entrepreneur. But in the book, he basically said that his philosophy wasn't work, make money and then give. It was give. And yeah. he gave first. Even if he didn't have anything, he gave. And his means aligned with his ability to give. It was fa it's fascinating, right? Where and it's very difficult. It's very risky, you know, and it's not it's counterintuitive to what most people think. But I've seen that and I and I'd be lying to say that I have adopted that mindset. But I look at, you know, my relationships, I look at my team, and I try to give as much as possible. Right. And then, you know, the, the, the remuneration from that is what increases wealth. But as far as how is concerned, I mean, that's where I would start. I mean, I was, I was saying before, how you go about doing it is knowing, your, knowing yourself and really being clear about what you want. Then being clear about, you know, what strengths and abilities that you, that you have and how they apply to the professional marketplace. And it, it's, it's, it's curious. I'm curious about, you know, all, all sorts of, you know, connections that people make. And I've seen them over and over and over again. But once they connect with those strengths, those abilities, those things they do well, when they get to do them for the benefit of others and they get paid for it, suddenly like life has more meaning, work has more meaning. And then it's the constant and never ending improvement of that, which is a lifelong pursuit. Um, that's, that's the how. And as far as from a financial standpoint, what I look at, we created you know, in the book that I wrote, we, we set up something called the hierarchy of wealth, which gives you a sequence of the assets that you acquire. And the first two tiers in that hierarchy, the two tiers that take priority, one is your you know, pretty much riskless type of investments. The investments that give the highest yield with the least amount or any amount of risk. Then on top of that, it's investing in the things that you have control over right? Which is typically your business. It's also investment that you have expertise in. Uh, and that's really where you start. And that's 50 to 60% of a, a person's overall wealth as you look at what we recommend and advise. And then the tiers above that are the investments that you don't have control over. You're taking risk, you're rolling the dice. Uh, and that's where people usually start. So that's where we look at, you know, really ways in which you can structure your savings where it's systematic. And then having a way in which you are constantly in never-ending improvement, your skill set to make more money. And our goal for clients, right, the goal that we've kind of pushed in the, in the I pushed in the book and have written articles about, is trying to get a 10% raise per year, right? Using that whole mindset to invest in yourself, figure out ways in which you can improve yourself, your ability to produce, your ability to create value for others, and increase that by 10% per year. That's the start, that's the starting point. And if you can do that, right, that's gonna give you way more wealth than any investment can give you. Yeah, look, I think that's you know, it's good fundamentals. And um, I know for me, I've had a financial planner. It's actually amazing. I, I don't know what it's like in the, U, the US, but here in Australia, I think 2% of the population have financial planners or finance, uh, use a financial services company. Do you know what it is in the US? I don't know the percentage. Yeah, but look, at you know, it's terribly low, right? Um, well, here so what they do, yeah, usually most people use their retirement plans as the primary vehicle and each company that has these plans has a uh, an administrator and a custodian that pretty much provide a, an advisor. It's not necessarily a one on one; it's mm -hmm. more one on many. Uh, but usually, you know, people have some sort of uh, of advice coming from that person. But I don't know the percentage off the top of my head. Yeah, but you know, uh, I think you know it's like you mentioned before about having two business coaches at the moment and always having coaches. I think for you know, as a as myself, a solopreneur coming out of corporate, you know, my greatest risk at the moment is my health and running the business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a whole backstory there that I won't dive into. But, you know, I think, therefore, being really smart about where you invest your money outside of just you, I think is really important. And, you know, if you've got, I love that 60% rule and that's done. What are some of the areas at the moment that you see or you advise clients to go into in that 40%? Well, this is, yeah, and, and this is where we align uh, education with the actual investment choice, 
right? So looking at the investment providers there, you know, it could be in all the different asset classes. We have relationships with all those asset classes. Uh, it could be it could be trading, right? Learning how to position portfolios uh, and securities and 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 hedge. We have a great uh, great partner we use for that. But it also could be uh, real estate syndication. Okay, these this is where it gets dicey because you know most syndications, which is essentially a a person that is putting together uh, an investment offering that uh, you know is passive in nature for you, right? For me. That's the, that's the categorization of the tier above that whole 60%. So the categorization above is, you know, you're choosing an investment where you're giving up control and you're relinquishing it to somebody else. So now it becomes, you know, your responsibility to understand that person, understand the actual underlying investment, be educated about it, uh, as well as know the structure of the underlying business. Because that's where I've seen most investments fail. It's not in the investment idea. It's the structure of the business behind the investment. Uh, but there's also, you know, investments like life settlements. That's a big one uh, recently, but you're also starting to see, you know, fraud and misrepresentation and bad business in all of these areas, right? And that's what usually will collapse an investment or limit the, uh, the returns. But life settlements is big because you have a, an, an aging population. So senior settlements are where a, uh, a senior can, you know, a, that has a, uh, usually a life insurance policy can sell it to a, a fund for money right now. And then the fund becomes the beneficiary, beneficiary of that policy. And when the person passes away, then money is dispersed to the fund, right? So that's another investment where it's pooled, it's syndicated. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is completely logical. It's just, you know, it's the underlying team, the company that's running it. Uh, and you know, and that's what we try to get clients to do is to do their due diligence, educate themselves, understand how the investment works before they start putting money, uh, putting money into it. But we try to side with a person, you know, essentially putting money into something they understand. And it's the idea of education that reduces uh, risk. Well, it increases control and it reduces risk. But most people don't approach it that way. It's this guy seems smart. Um, it has a high rate of return. Okay. I'm going to do that. Right. And it's that like risk part of our brain that dominates the decision-making process. And that is, you know, mitigated or reduced based on the level of education you have, which we, uh, which we lead with. Yeah. Look, I think that's so smart. And, you know, in a way we're doing a similar thing with the experts that we collect around the world. Cause I think another area where solopreneurs can make, unfortunately, bad investment choices is on the the partners they pick, the experts that they pick. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you, you talked about relationships and vetting and, and all of those things. I think the exact same thing can happen in, you know, the big investments that you make in your business, websites, you know, online platforms, providers, blah, blah, blah. So, yep. uh, yeah, I think the same philosophy. And if it looks too good, <laughs> you know, nine out of ten times it is. So um, that's great. And I really well, love the way, the, you know, I'll, yeah, you, well, sorry, I, I, you know, the, the, what I talked about a few minutes ago with regard to how you hire people, that I've used that whole top grading idea. And you can, I, I think you could, the book's on Audible, it's on Amazon. I think you could even pull the questions down online somewhere. But you can, you can have those questions for the specific investment providers, okay? Because there's breadcrumbs there as well, as far as them understanding their craft, their expertise, and there are, are lots of flags that can come up based on the questions that you, that you ask them. Uh, but the neophyte, the person that is, you know, I would say naive to investment, that's not an investment that you want to uh, be a part of. You wanna, you wanna know what it is, how it works, and then also the right questions to ask to determine if the person that is actually taking your money is going to be a fiduciary uh, or do the right or do the right thing, especially when times get tough. And we're at the brink of, you know, some economic difficulty, right? Where, you know, I, I would say that there are probably a, a lots of firms that are in hurtful situations, but are able to paper over it because the economy keeps puttering along. Yeah. And look, I, I, heard on a podcast the other day that and I can't remember who, but let's say one of the top hedge guys in the U S just parked a half a billion dollars in cash, which, you know, given the exchange rate at the moment, that's a, uh, the exchange rate, the interest rate, that's a pretty severe move 
thinking that there's going to be a like a 2008 event again. Mm. Um, you know, I know that's an extreme view, but you know, it's a crystal ball and none of this information that we're giving here is something you should rely upon. Obviously go to your own financial planner, but what's your view on that doomsday prediction? Well, you know, I've been talking about this for a really, really long time. You know, the, there are so many unknowns. I mean, fundamentally, it doesn't make sense, okay? But it's been that way for, for several years, really since 2008 and 2009. Mm. Uh, after all the, you know, uh, bailouts and stimulus that was provided worldwide. It, fundamentals don't make sense. However, it, they've kind of perpetuated the, the same type of activity where you're using, you know, artificial stimulus to... Uh, prop up businesses, prop up markets, prop up values, and prop up growth. And, you know, fundamentally, it's not sustainable, but at the same time, they can continue to do that. And, and ultimately, could, it could last another 10 years. We just don't, we just don't know. Um, but when things fundamentally don't make sense to me, um, I pull out. I mean, I've sold most of the real estate that I have. Um, I have a lot of cash right now, and I'm looking for opportunities in, in uh, business, mostly, mostly with some joint ventures and you know an aging population that you know does not have any suitors as far as you know people to to uh, to buy their business, and and that's where I'm uh, focusing a lot of my attention because I've I've become an expertise in that you know those areas and I'm just going to grow not necessarily organically but you know gr- grow uh, horizontally uh, if you if you will so that's where I don't know it, it, n- nobody really has a crystal ball and anyone that you know can predict that. You know, and there's some of the experts out there that have, you know, called dates and called this and called that. And, and fundamentally they're right. But at the same time, you know, markets are never rational, right? It's the whole, you know, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. That's that <laughs> whole saying. And, and it's totally, and it's true because it's lasted yeah. a long, a long time. So parking money in cash, you know, it, it's, it's smart, but it's also not smart. It just depends on really what the the overall vision is for the person or the or the company, uh, because cash doesn't do anything. Yeah, right? and that's, and I I think the underlining mes- message here is you know get someone in your team that is the expert in this. You know, so get a Patrick, get someone that is doing this every day rather than trying to do it yourself. And and when I made that switch, it was probably I can't remember two thousand and three something like that. Um, you know, it's just made a world of difference. So I meet with my financial advisor, you know, twice a year and he, you know, he's got, he makes, he, we always um, endorse his decisions, but his decisions are far better than the ones that I am. And the thing that generates all the money for him to do it is working in my business. So I'm much better working in and on my business than I am doing my financial planning. But look, we could go on forever on this. I have got some other questions I'd love to ask you, Patrick, and we'll have to have you back on, especially around buying businesses. That's something that I know a lot of people are interested in where there is um, th- there is some subjectivity, uh, sorry, object, yeah, subjectivity in, in the markets. Mm-hmm. Just the one question I would like to ask you, though, just before we go on, is, mm-hmm. you know, you, you talk about Wall Street don't always have your best interests at heart. Um, just tell me a little bit more about that just quickly. Well, why don't they always have your best interests at heart? Well, they're for, they're, you know, they're for-profit businesses, right? And if you look at just human nature, you know, people are, are hardwired to, uh, to do what's best for them first, right? And, and looking at you know, really where money is made in, in the market, you know, it, it does not benefit. It benefits everybody else. And then in the end, at the end, is when the investor is benefited. And, you know, it's just one of those, you know, it's one of those relationships that I think started off on uh, really good, good footing. Uh, but based on where we're at in market cycles, uh, as well as how volatile things are, you know, it just hasn't really, so if you look at trends and averages and factor in taxes and inflation, you know, it hasn't really benefited the end, uh, the end investor. So you just got to look at the numbers. Uh, but then also, you know, there are those that have really become experts, okay, in taking companies public uh, and doing, you know, reverse, uh, you know, reverse IPOs and then, you know, restructuring and then re-IPO. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things out there that are taking advantage of just how big the capital markets are. 
but it's the businesses that are making the money. It's the traders that are making the money. The underlying, you know, passive investor is the one that usually, you know, gets, uh, gets taken to the cleaners. So it's the whole higher, it's the, it's the pecking order, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the, the hierarchy associated with the investment world. Who's at the top? Who's next? Who's after that? Who's after that? Who's after? And where do you stack? <laughs> and usually, the you know the passive investor does not stack uh, within the top you know percentile where the money is uh, is made. And then also, again, it, it goes to my the point before: people are def, you know earning earning money, deferring for a future period of time in which they're going to uh, retire, right? And I think that philosophy is you know inherently flawed. And usually investment is set up for that purpose. However, if the idea is flawed, then you have to question the strategies that align with that idea. Uh, and that's where, you know, I would say investment in, uh, in business, investment in yourself to figure out how to make more money is, should be the majority of investment. Uh, and then finally toward the end is where you make those investments that are uh, more passive in, uh, in nature. Great. Well, before we go into the live section, I'd like to tell you about my book called Build, Live, Give. I go through the lessons I learned from leaving Coca-Cola to run my own business, how I scaled and kept it going whilst going through my recent transplant. I give you the same five growth drivers, which I use to help hundreds of solopreneurs to build, live and give. Just go to buildlivegive.com forward slash book to get your copy today. And there'll also be links in the show notes, not just to that, but also everything else that Patrick and I have spoken about. So Patrick, the next section is the live section. Tell us about some of the daily habits which make you successful. Well, I'm, I'm big about, you know, my, my, my different, the different states that I show up in, in life. Uh, you know, I have a few hats that I, you know, that I have my, you know, being a father, being a, a husband, uh, being a leader here, being a, being a friend. And so I'm very conscious on a daily basis of, you know, what my day consists of and the state that I show up in. Uh, so I believe that, you know, the structures of our body is how we experience the world. And when it does not operate the way that it, it does, I know it sounds like you've experienced some health challenges, right? You don't, you don't have the same perspective, right? You don't, you have to, to try even harder to uh, you know, to be in the right state, uh, to have the right perspective, uh, to you know, have the you know the, the right emotions. You know, my my daughter, my thirteen year old, we had a long story, but I took her, my youngest, my son, my five year old, and then her uh, up to Park City uh, to do like an overnight because my wife and my other daughter had something going on, and she asked me a question which was fascinating. She asked me, Dad, for people that were born deaf. Um, how do they explain things to themselves in their mind? They've never experienced language, right? So how do they, like, what do they say? To, what do they say to themselves or do they say anything? And it's a fascinating question, right? But ultimately we're, we're seeking emotion and emotion comes from meaning and meaning is described by words. And, and you don't necessarily, you know, words aren't where the value is. It's the meaning and the emotion that's attached to that. Uh, and that's a whole other, you know, philosophical, philosophical question. Right. But that's, you know, ultimately where I place my attention is on my energy level, my, my physiology and how I show up uh, daily. So my routines, you know, consist of just eating, eating healthy uh, and sweating. I, I may not be able to do a full, and this morning I did a full on workout and it was nuts. Uh, but I try to sweat every morning, do something that's going to get me physically intense enough to sweat. Uh, right. And that's big for me. Those two things, your, what you put in your body. Uh, and how you push your body and exercise your body, that right there will change your life. It'll, it'll change, you know, the experience uh, you have each day. And, uh, you know, you're a busy guy. You're helping lots of clients. You've got 60 team members. You know, on average, how many hours would, would you work a week? Uh, I'm, well, this is not the answer that I would have had uh, last year, but I've, I've definitely focused my, uh, my time this year. That's been a big goal of mine. Uh, so I'm, I'm about 60 hours a week uh, between 50 and 60. It was a lot more 70 to 80, you know, a year ago. Right. And what's been the biggest changes you've implemented to, to reduce that by 20? Uh, it, it's definitely uh, my team, right? It's hiring the right people, putting the right people in the right places, uh, and then uh, training on the expectations uh, that I have, but then also 
knowing that you know the situations that are going to present themselves that they have stewardship over it and uh, you know I'm here as far as like consulting training uh, but I, I usually will you know have my executive team take the majority of what I had done in the past and it's been uh, it's been huge I find there's there's some days where I'm like I don't know what to do today like <laughs> should, should I go in or should I you know and which is really golf. or go play golf you know uh, but you know, it definitely has put a lot of, you know, responsibility for me to, uh, be a better leader, right. It is to, you know, refine the vision, refine, uh, the values, uh, help hiring more people and hiring the right people and ensuring that there's the right, you know, the right and appropriate training for people. Great. And, uh, we talked about Cynthia before and your three beautiful children. Cynthia is listening right now. So what would you like to say to her about the support she's given you through this amazing journey? Well, we just we just went to a, a week long relationship mastery course in in Hawaii, uh, and so my answer probably would have been different, you know, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Uh, but now, I mean, she she's been she's I've gotten so lucky. I mean, there are I definitely have you know so much gratitude in my heart for uh, how she has adapted to my changes throughout my life. Uh, and there's these three primary roles that we learned of, of a woman uh, when it comes to their relationship. It's the, it's the queen, the mother, and the uh, uh, temptress. And it's amazing the mix of those roles because if, there is a, uh, if there's too much of either of those roles, you don't have a good outcome, right? If a mother is too motherly, then she is uh, you know, taken advantage of. If you have a temptress that is too temptressy, that's a word. Uh, then <laughs> it is know, now. <laughs> they're you know they're taken for they're they're uh, not taken seriously. If you have a queen that's too queeny, then you know that is where you have the the person that's not fun to be around because you're going to get scolded and told you know you know it, there's this kind of letter of the law mentality. So it's the mix of those roles based on the circumstance and situation. That, uh, that my wife has like intuitively shown up to. Uh, and of course, now that she's actually aware of that, uh, it's, uh, I'm sure it's going get to even, get even better. But I just got lucky, Paul. I mean, I, plain and simple. Like that, this whole week, I'm like, man, I totally like struck gold. Like I, <laughs> I don't know what I did. It definitely wasn't my teenage years, but I don't know what I did, but I got, you know, a, 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 an amazing woman as part of my, part of my life. Well, uh, well, it's in uh, a lot of cases, it's not what you, it's what you didn't do, which is often more important than what you did do. Probably so, uh, a lot of truth to that. Yeah. So the give section is the next section. So what's, uh, you know, what's a way that you give back in, in the community or in the world? Well, there's a few, there's a few things that I do. You know, there's a, uh, there's an organization in in Utah that was formed in Utah, and it's called uh, Operation Underground uh, Railroad, and uh, it is essentially these ex uh, special forces, which is like you know the the Navy SEALs and our you know Army Army Rangers, and and they uh, they essentially go in with uh, you know typically third world emerging markets, but there's a lot of it in the U.S. as well. Uh, of human trafficking and uh, and sex trafficking and it's a massive massive worldwide problem at a scale that most people would are are just oblivious to going on everywhere in you know air and, and they basically will strategically you know position themselves as perpetrators right in order to uh, go in and they've, they've saved tons and tons of children, tons of women worldwide. It's, it's really inspiring. So that's one organization that, that I, that I love to see what they're doing and, and I uh, contribute to. And then uh, there's another one called, it's basically like a, a, a kind of a more libertarian think tank and lobbying group that is local that's in, that's in Utah, but they essentially uh, lobby, you know, laws regarding our freedoms. Like the example is like, you know, Airbnb is an incredible service, and you know the the city was going to uh, ban Airbnb and make it illegal, right? Because obviously hotels don't benefit from it. So it kind of they go in and they essentially uh, fight for more freedoms, uh, and also you know fight for laws that would uh, prevent more more freedom. So anyway, that's another group that I, I right. participate in. They're called Libertas, uh, and then there's a uh, there's a group that's 
you know, also here in Utah, a smaller nonprofit that my wife is on the board of. And they, you know, essentially provide uh, money and funding for kids' education down in Mexico, uh, as well as like usually holiday, uh, holiday type of uh, gifts and, and food. So those are just, you know, those are those are some of the ways in which I I try to uh, I try to give. And we've gone down, you know, to the uh, to this specific group called Stefan, uh, Stefano and and uh, and done you know, uh, done some things down there in Mexico. They help with hospitals and health, health facilities and schools, uh, you know, mostly building and improving the facilities. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, those are some of the things that I've, uh, that I, that I've done. Excellent. Well, you'd make uh, John Hutzman very happy. Uh, so, uh, the last, well, he built eight- a, you know, a huge, the, one of the best cancer institutes in the world. And so I, I've, a little, a little bit of ways to go. <laughs> That's all. It's all relative, as you know, being a financial uh, p- uh, planner. So the last section is the action section, and I will need quick, rapid responses sure. uh, from you. But uh, the first one is, what are your top three personal effectiveness tips? Um, you know, I, uh, it's what I mentioned already. It's, it's my morning routine is kind of having these, like, committed things that I will do every, every single day. Uh, and it's the idea of eating healthy and and sweating, uh, and then also I'm, you know, I'm I've committed to really understanding and improving the state in which I show up to circumstances because circumstances are always going to change. There's yeah. you know sometimes we have control over them, but the default my default position is I don't have control over the circumstance, but I do have control over the state in which I show up, uh, and so I'm very aware of my physical presence. The words that I use, the focus that I have, you know, especially when it comes to situations that would would really throw me off, right? Make me emotionally uh, off kilter. Uh, so those are those are the two things as far as my effectiveness is concerned that I'm super aware of. Great. And uh, what's a bit of technology that you couldn't run your business without? Uh, I would say so. I have a I have this like virtual whiteboard. It's like a drawing board called a Wake, Wacom tablet or Wacom tablet. I've heard them heard pronounced a couple ways. Uh, but Camtasia, which is like a screen capture tool, and then Zoom. We're on Zoom right now. So Zoom, Zoom is a huge tool as far as video conferencing, uh, recording. I mean, if it weren't for Zoom, life, you know, life would be more challenging for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, well, this would, yeah, this, I can't even think of that. And what's the best source of new ideas for you and your business? Uh, for me, it's you know it's going to uh, events. Uh, so I I try to attend you know anywhere between three to to six personal development uh, events per year. Uh, and in in those events, it unplugs me from my routine. It un- unplugs me from the distractions of other things that I have going on, and that's where all of my ideas flow. Uh, so that's a big source of new ideas is being around. Uh, like-minded people at events where I'm, I'm learning, interacting, networking. And it's weird. It's just, you know, there's a, there's a book called where good ideas come from. I can't remember the, uh, the author, right. But it is that idea of, you know, when you come together in a, in a group in a certain environment, right, your mind operates differently. Things come to it. That it's different than, you know, any other situation. So I try to put myself in those environments as often, as often as possible. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, I've saved the best and probably the hardest question to last, but what is the impact that you want to leave on the world? You know, I, I look at the gifts that we have as human beings. And from my experience with a lot of different, a lot of different people, pain always comes from wanting the status quo. And what I would leave the world is that that is one of life's paradoxes. Um, I believe pain is going to be the catalyst for amazing, for, for amazing freedom, growth, and, uh, and life's fulfillment. And that's why I try to talk about as often as I can on the podcast and the, in the book um, is to reframe what fear and pain is, right? And to create rules around it where those are the things you want to seek uh, as opposed to shy away from, uh, I believe that through you know through experiencing that is where you are going to understand more about yourself, 
understand more about what's possible for you. Uh, but I think, you know, it's been framed in our day and age that that's what is bad, right? You don't want to have pain. You want to play it safe, right? And I just believe that that is, that is not what life is uh, about. And those that I have seen make the biggest difference uh, may not necessarily explain what I just, what I just said the same way, but in principle, it is, uh, it's the same, right? Amazing things happen because people uh, are able to uh, conquer fear. Fear is their friend and their energy and their momentum, uh, not this, you know, monster that uh, you, you shy away from. Brilliant. Well, well said. So uh, that and all the other great comments and the links that Patrick has mentioned will be in the show notes. So certainly go and look for them there. But uh, you can find out more about the hierarchy of uh, what was the hierarchy? Hierarch- Sorry, yeah, the hierarchy of, of, wealth. of wealth. There you go. <laughs> I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can uh, find that in his fantastic book. You can go to headsortailsiwin.com or one word. Once again, we'll have the link in the show notes there. And you can also find out more about Patrick on um, on his podcast and everything else. So that's on his website, which once again, we'll have the links in the show notes. So Patrick, uh, brilliant having you on. It's been a, a really interesting conversation. I think, you know, you've, you've shown here that it's more about just the finances. It's about the whole person. And I think a lot of people will get many great tips out of this conversation. So uh, thanks for sharing today. It's been, it's been an awesome conversation. My pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. Thanks, Patrick. Bye. That was a really inspiring interview by Patrick. I know it was a bit longer than normal interviews, but he, you know, he had so much value. I just kept, kept it rolling. You can get all the show notes at buildlivegive.com. And if you believe someone you know would benefit from the show, I'd love if you could share it with them and they'd certainly thank you for it as well. Patrick would love to get your feedback and appreciation on his interview. So all the links to contact him will be in the show notes. And you can also get the book mentioned in the podcast, Build, Live, Give. You can get that at buildlivegive.com forward slash book. All of this and more will be in the show notes. Please take action to build new revenue streams to fund your lifestyle and give back. Thank you for listening to the Build, Live, Give podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. It would mean the world to us.